these services are just as necessary for optimal long-term, I would definitely advocate long-term health and wellness of your student athlete. Like even once they graduate from your institution, there's a lot of verbal buy-in, but then it's the follow through with, hey, like, yes, we said this and we are going to back it by our actions. Hello and welcome to the Eat More Carbs podcast. My name is Jenna Fisher and I'm here with my co-host Riley Beatty. Before we get into part two of our interview with Sam Marisak, we're going to do a quick high and low. So Riley, as always, can you kick us off? Yeah. So my high for the week and my low for the week are actually the same. My high is I finally got cleared to to run um, at my last doctor's appointment, which I'm so excited about. So it's the first time I have ran in about eight months. So that's my high because I love to run. I have a marathon in November, which one step at a time. My low is also that I have not run in eight months. So Mm -hmm. it has definitely been challenging and I guess very humbling getting back into running, especially because I could only run a couple of times per week, because as we always talk about, you have to make you know, take baby steps. You have to take things slow. Um, so you don't get hurt. So you don't burn yourself out. And then also like, I can't run with Charlie yet. So I have to make sure that she has care so I can go for a run. High and low. High and low is all about running this week for Riley. I will also echo you on my high and low being the same story. I love to sleep. I love to be up early, but I hate an alarm clock. So my dear sweet husband uses his watch as an alarm clock. And then when he gets up in the morning, it wakes me up too. This morning, however, I was in such a deep sleep that when he got out of bed, when the alarm went off, I didn't wake up like not at all. And he just thoughtfully let me sleep. However, when the sun started coming up and it starts coming in the windows, I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, like that moment of panic that you have when you realize that you've overslept. And so I was like, what time is it? Is it noon? Like, have I missed things this morning? So the low part of that was my pure panic this morning when I thought I had slept through all of my morning things that I needed to do. My high is that I have such a thoughtful husband that does things like that and lets me sleep in a couple of minutes. And really, I had only slept in until about 6.50. Usually we're up at six. So it wasn't like I had actually slept through everything this morning. So it's all good. Shout out to Nolan for letting you sleep. That's awesome. Right. Got a couple extra minutes this morning and I guess I needed it. So I'm feeling good today. (laughs) We're going to get back into our interview with Sam. As always, if you have questions for Riley and I, just let us know, but enjoy the rest of the podcast. It's like, well, you didn't notice when like I was like a broken toy on the shelf. Like, why is it a problem now? Even though like, you know, hey, like there's got to be some kind of accountability. I graduated in 2012, I believe it was 2014, Baylor hired a sports dietitian. And I really feel like that's kind of when the NCAA changed a lot of the rules, regulations regarding feeding, fueling athletes. And I don't know what the straw was that broke the camel's back, right? That's way above my pay grade as far as big decisions like that being made. But I share all that to say, like, I'm really happy for NCAA athletes now because that's if you don't have a sports dietitian if if it's if not full time if you don't have a consultant option th- that's very much the minority have you all seen otherwise i was going to say shout out to the deregulation of feeding that happened in 2014 that legislation allowed athletic departments to kind of spend as much money air quotes as much money as they needed to to feed student athletes and dietitians fell into that i remember that specifically because i graduated in 2014 and I just missed it and I was so sad because I wanted a limited food (laughs) as a student athlete. As a non-student athlete, I didn't go through things like that, but with how many conversations I've had with Riley about the access to dietitians on a campus, especially for those involved in athletics, like it's such a valuable thing to be able to bring that piece to athletics, especially for people who are competing at such a high level. I don't think I realized as well just the wide discrepancies even among d1 institutions as far as right even alum funding like you have someone come in like hey i want to provide this for the athletic department and then you look at like maybe a smaller d1 school that you know is on the cusp of d1 d2 you're like wow even the access from one school to another varies so much and it's like oh my gosh like i know specifically at baylor now compared to back then right they've got like bu bucks and students can go to certain places on campus and just swipe a card it's covered the fueling stations yeah just crazy i definitely 
definitely still think there is, it has gotten a lot better, but I do think that there is a shortage still. And there's also like a lack of resources that are available because you'll have a dietitian for the department, but then that dietitian has 800 athletes. So how are they supposed to be doing all the food service stuff and then like making presentations, doing one-on-one counseling? Like how are they supposed to be doing all of that on their own? Dietitians are magicians. You didn't know? We do it all. Riley, that kind of makes me think of when we were at UNLV and we had one dietitian for every sport and we were going to be able to sit in on one like counseling session that she had with an athlete on campus. And it was you and I as the dietetic interns at UNLV at the time. And then there was a room full of strength training interns too, because they all wanted that knowledge as well, because there was one dietitian and gosh knows how many strength training, you know, interns and athletic trainers that were on staff there. So they were all trying to get that same knowledge just as we were because they wanted to try to help out in whatever way they could. So it's definitely stretched thin when you are a campus sports dietitian. Sam, what other struggles did you have being on campus as a sports dietitian, even if when you were in like a contract role that like you kind of came across? Well, it's no secret. College athletics is a business. It's a very profitable business. And being a sports dietitian, right, you're part of the business model. And so having the same core values and mission, right? Overall student athlete health and wellness, right? Obviously, hopefully, right? A pillar within that administration. And so in promoting that, right? A sports dietitian needs to be adequately funded, similar to your example about, hey, this many strength and conditioning interns or individuals compared to like the single sole dietitian slash magician. And so I would say kind of one of the biggest challenges is from a financial standpoint of, hey, like, these services are just as necessary for optimal long-term. I would definitely advocate long-term health and wellness of your student athlete. Like even once they graduate from your institution, there's a lot of verbal buy-in, but then it's the follow through with, Hey, like, yes, we said this and we are going to back it by our actions. What do you, what would you recommend for maybe an athletic department that is interested in working with a dietitian or getting, you know, access to nutrition resources that are the correct ones? Like, do you have any advice or recommendations for those? I feel like y'all are probably more better equipped to speak to this specific point. One thing personally that I found so helpful is CPSDA, which it's been so refreshing coming from a background of not working or consulting in the athletic world to be able to chat with people like y'all who are so willing to share helpful information and even past mistakes. Like, hey, I did this and it was a train wreck. Like you can do it, but I'm just telling you, this was my experience. I I haven't found a subset of dietetics that has been so welcoming and helpful. I think there's so many athletic departments out there who are interested in providing sports nutrition resources to their athletes, but they might not have, you know, $80,000 to hire a sports dietitian. Yeah. Yeah. So the consulting route, right? And just say, hey, do you have like a guide or an e-guide or could you provide team talks on a quarterly basis? And maybe just start there and see what interest is and what kind of rapport relationship you can establish as opposed to maybe, hey, I can only come in if you hire me full time. Breaking into that sports RD space can sometimes be a little bit difficult. I feel like Riley and I talk about this a lot. But at the end of the day, getting the information to the athletes, like that should be everyone's number one priority. So finding ways that works not only for the school and what their budget is, but making sure that the information is also accurate and getting to the people it needs to get to. Because for so many athletes, they don't have that guidance and it would change so much for them from an athletic standpoint, but also from like a longevity and health standpoint, if they just had something that was accurate that they could refer back to and make sure that they had you know, something, something to go off of. Yes. Yes. And um, it's so interesting because I feel like I entered the big girl world of finding a job and I knew like I started applying in 2014 because there became more sports dietitian openings and so much of the feedback I got was, well, you don't have any experience. And I was like, well, this is like a brand new thing. And, but there were so many, so, so many people that were a little bit younger, but had done like concentration or like had volunteered as maybe like an athletic department volunteer. And so then I was like, well, I'm just going to sit, like, I'll just make money. So, you know, like went like acute care, long-term care, 
corporate. And then I was like, you know what? I have street cred. I'm coming back. She's back, everybody. (laughs) I love it. No, I think it is really valuable though. Like just why we talked about, you know, you know, being a mom, right? Being a student athlete or being an athlete, right? Like I have never ran 50 miles and I am never going to run 50 miles, but you have. And on mile 42, you know how you're going to feel and you know how others are going to feel. So you can help provide like tangible advice as both a professional and as an athlete. Riley, 50K, please don't overestimate me. 50K, okay. That's still <laughs> That's like a 20 mile difference. Okay, maybe, I don't know, maybe then, maybe I will run a 50K, but not a 50 mile. I was really, I was giving you all the props. You shouldn't have corrected me. What is your training like? The answer to everything in nutrition is it depends. We sometimes joke about calling this the It Depends podcast. So I'm sure that it's dependent on the day and things like that. But I'd love to hear a little bit about like your training and your fueling kind of in preparation for your 50K. Yeah. So I have some friends, previous like work friends who are in the ultra world. They've shared some some input. You've probably heard of like Hal Higdon. It's kind of like your crash course 101 like first marathon training so I put in like first ultra training and I would say the biggest difference is right instead of one long run you have two and they're back to back Mm -hmm. to mimic the fatigue you're gonna feel in the race I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately most ultra marathons are run on trails right which is good less pounding a little bit easier to recover but it's a lot more technical like I feel so old I'm like wow my balance is awful if I slip I'm gonna break a hip and so living by the ocean there's no hills there's like some trails but they're not real I'm going to use like the wrong adjective they're they're not very like trailish so I feel like that's probably gonna be to my detriment on race day but you know got to work with what you got so I would say that's really the biggest thing from a nutrition standpoint right we know evidence-based recommendations and those ultra endurance events two to three hours plus ideally based on numerous studies we're looking at 90 grams per hour from single or multiple transportable carbohydrates. And then it's also, I would say, overcoming flavor fatigue. I haven't done it yet, but my longest long run is gonna be five hours. So a big emphasis is time on feet. So they recommend, hey, every so, like every 20 minutes, take a two minute walk break. I was like, okay, yes, I can do that. I've heard of runners being like, I just got to the point where even the sound of something sweet or savory made me dry heave. And so don't really know like what that's going to look like, but I, I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess and say variety is the spice of life. So, hey, like make sure you have lots of practice taking in, whether it be like liquid calories as well as solids in different types. And because, right, lower intensity, right, the pace you run in an ultramarathon is going to be a lot different than a 5K. So your body's able to utilize fat as more of a substrate as opposed to just carbohydrates. And so you, you can definitely get a little bit more creative with your, your fueling sources. And then one thing I've never done, have you guys ever done this? I was like, I'm going to give it a shot. I bought one of the Gatorade sweat patches. You have, okay. I have used them, but when I used them, they were like very new. So I'm really curious to hear what your experience is because I think that like the technology and the practicality of them has really gone up. Okay. So I just did it last week. Common sense. I know I don't sweat a lot, but my recommended fluid intake per hour was 12 to 15 ounces, which is like, okay. And I like that you're able to input into the app, like the weather conditions and all that stuff. Cause I was like, obviously you're going to sweat a lot more Gatorade if it's 90 degrees versus winter time. I, I wish I would have bought two though. So then I could have at least had more than one data point and I only bought one. I mean, they're, it's, it's not like they're super expensive, but obviously um, the ultra I'm doing is in the summer in the Midwest. So potential be super hot and humid. So I was like, and then it didn't, it said I had zero milligrams of sodium lost and I, I was running for an hour and I'm like, I. I don't think that's right. I've heard they don't really collect sweat that well and they often fall off. That's what well, I'm... Mine didn't fall off. Okay. <laughs> Next time I'll just get a piece of scotch tape. Tape it on. That's super disappointing. Yes, because I was like, well, we know sodium electrolytes are so important, especially in endurance events. So I don't know. Maybe I'll order a few more. Do you guys have input there as far as like cost effective 
a high school athlete could do this for measuring sweat loss. We talked about this on another podcast. There's something that I took, I guess I'm now we have took the phrase from him, but one of our previous guests, his name is Nate. He described it really well. He's a physical therapist. And one of the things that he always, what he talked about that he said with his athletes is don't ask for extra credit until you've done your homework. And what I see a lot of the time and Jenna correct me if I'm wrong. There's so many like low hanging fruits. There's so many things that we need to be doing. People are just like, I need to do this like really fancy thing. When it's like, you drink two Celsius a day, you don't eat breakfast and you eat a bar for lunch. Like we don't need to do sweat testing with you (laughs) right now. (laughs) And not being mean, like that's just the real state of things. You got to master the basics. Like if, if you're drinking two hydro flasks of water a day and you have four hours of training, then like we know you're not hydrated. Are you someone that can do like the goo packets and stuff like that, that a lot of runners use? Or are you kind of adverse to those? I know they're kind of hit or miss with people. Yeah, I've used them for, I've done five marathons in the past. Again, nothing like I'm one of those people when I graduated from Baylor, I was like, I will never in my life. Again, I just don't have the desire to try and run as fast as I can. So I need a new different goal. Hence, I was like, okay, like I'll do some marathons. Some of them were for charity. And then I was like, you know what? Like, let's try an ultra. It might be kind of fun. If you're not learning, if you're if you're not growing, like what, what's the fun in that? Like if there's no new challenge. I love that. So Sam, we have a couple questions for you to kind of end the podcast. We ask everybody these. Um, but it is the Eat More Carbs podcast. So our first question is, what is your favorite carbohydrate? My favorite carbohydrate, it's seasonal, depending on weather. Lately, it's been some homemade ramen. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, not like homemade ramen noodles, just like I'm kind of skeptical about what they put in that packet. That's um, fair. Yes. Like, don't get me wrong. I definitely enjoy it. But I'm like, as far as like performance goes, this probably is a sometimes not an all the time addition. With it being colder, I like to come home from a run. And believe it or not, we have a I jokingly refer to it as a hydration station in our bathroom. We have like, we opted to not put a tub in because we're like, we're young, we don't need a bathtub. We'll, We'll just like make the shower bigger. And then we have like, coffee bar, mini fridge. It's like, what am I feeling? And so I'll grab like Gatorade or something, take a shower and then come down and get food. And lately it's been ramen. I love your hydration station. I might have to steal that. (laughs) I just call it a tub a dust collector right now because like I would, I would not use it. I'm not a bath person anyway, but I freaking love that you were just like, make the shower bigger and let's put in hydration station. That's like chef's kiss, the most beautiful (laughs) idea. I love it. Yes. Yes. I don't have a whole lot of fun, creative ideas, but that one, yes, I'm proud of. It was, it was mine, not my husband's. He made fun of it. And you know what? He reaps the benefits. I like find a can of like, we call them sodies in our house. We'll find a can of like soda. He like drink it on the toilet. And then just like forgot to throw it away. Your hydration station and your toilet tea, like these might be like the two best things that we've ever talked about on the podcast. (laughs) What's your favorite pre-workout fuel or pre-run fuel? Yes. So depending on what kind of carbs we get at Costco in bulk for the week, lately it's been a few packs of fruit snacks because everyone in our house likes fruit snacks. So that also varies. It's like cycle it through. Sometimes like graham crackers, sometimes toast. Depends on what my run is. You know, if it's a long run then I'm going to try and eat a meal like a two hours before. It's like, oh, hey, three miles, not a big of, as big of a deal. We answered this a little bit, but what's your favorite post-workout fuel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did allude to ramen. I think I've heard you all mention most of the time my post-workout is some it just aligns with a meal. And so if it's not ramen, we do a lot of wraps. Our kids love tortillas. Also use them as Frisbees, but usually just a standard, like, give me a turkey cheese wrap. Love it. What's your favorite pair of kicks or maybe running shoes? Jenna's on the hunt for running shoes. You might you might have all of our answers here. Yeah, so running shoes, hands down. When you're in college, right, you just are kind of at the mercy of whoever your contract's with. So I didn't use Nikes in high school, but I've become a diehard Nike Pegasus fan. Okay, I think that's the second Nike Pegasus we've got. So it's also what my so husband I runs mentioned- in. He swears by him. 
Oh, really? Okay. I mentioned Mm -hmm. being told I didn't have the experience. So before getting matched for an internship, I worked for a year to run specialty store. So I used my fancy nutrition degree to sell shoes. I actually learned a lot about running shoes. So, right. It's like, do you supinate? Do you pronate? And some of your run specialty stores, you know, have the gait analysis. And so then it's like car shopping, depending on how your gait occurs, there's going to be shoes that have more support under your arch, right? If you're more prone to your arches falling in versus supinating if you run on the outsides of your feet. That's maybe one helpful tip for finding a comfortable shoe. Cause I feel like everyone just like finds a brand and they're like, oh, I like this brand. But then like knowing the mechanics of the shoe and your own anatomy, right? It's like PB and J, you got to make sure it matches. It's very individualized. I would say yeah. to quote you both, It depends. Okay. See, I've gone to the running stores and done the run analysis before, but I haven't been in several years and I definitely fell into the trap for a while that I liked Sockney. I fell into that trap where I just like exclusively wore their shoes and I just figured like I could just continue to wear that brand because it worked for the last time that I ran. So I just think I I picked the wrong ones at one point. So I've just kind of been cycling through wrong shoe after wrong shoe. So I should go and get a run analysis done because it's so individualized. I wear like a big Hoka. I'm a Hoka. I have, I've found a Hoka that I like though. It's not like the Hoka brand. I've had, I have a Hoka that I like and we love it. My husband wears these minimal shoes like not like the foot gloves but just the kind with like very minimal padding he's like you need to run in these it'll really strengthen your tendons I was like go run like 20 miles in those and tell me how you feel I have to laugh though he's so supportive he hates running what is the Nike Pegasus good for like since you know all the shoe mechanics like is that good for supination pronation long runs so You know, I never fact checked anyone or information I was told from the store, but my training included, if you have high arches, it's good because it's going to prevent you from running more so on the outside of your feet. Okay. Don't quote me. Kind of looking back on some of the things that we talked with Sam about, nutrition is very individualized when it comes to having a nutrition professional on your college campus. Finding some evidence-based resources to help you kind of navigate the world of nutrition is a good thing. We want to make sure that all athletes are being taken care of from an athletic standpoint, but also from a nutrition standpoint. No matter if you are running at a collegiate level or you are training for an ultra race, nutrition is extremely important. Sam, for people who want to reach out to you, maybe ask you questions, what is the best way for them? to find you you can find me on the gram do the kids still call it that at the dietitianist not a real word dietitian nutritionist combine the two or at www.dietitianist.org thank you sam for so much for being on this episode of the eat more carbs podcast we've so enjoyed you sharing your insight on sports nutrition as well as a little bit more on running if you want to ask riley and i questions you can always leave them in the comments of this podcast but you can also find us on instagram we're at the eat more carbs podcast you can find riley individually on instagram at riley.baity.nutrition and you can find me at jenna.fisher.nutrition thank you so much for listening please make sure you rate subscribe and review. And as always, make sure to eat more carbs.